Okay, and good evening everyone. Nice to see you all here again. And our meditators here locally. It's Friday night. Friday night, I think, is still the time when people go out and seek happiness in their various ways. And sometimes meditators get a little bit discouraged thinking about all the fun they could be having out in the world all the happiness that they're missing out on so much happiness out there no easy it's like low hanging fruit dangling just waiting to be plucked But if you think about it, if you're discerning and perceptive, there really isn't a lot of happiness out there to be had. All the happiness we might find is bound up by craving and clinging and addiction. We seek and we seek and we yearn for happiness. I'm going to get little bits of it. And then it's gone and we're left with clinging and craving and yearning. So in Buddhism we are much concerned with happiness as well. It's not that happiness isn't important that we're not interested in low-hanging fruit we're not interested in the easy form of happiness because unfortunately the easy forms of happiness are, are not truly satisfying these are the ones that are all caught up with clinging and craving like bait on a hook they get you more caught up and more entangled more stressed and they lead to more suffering but there are other kinds of happiness and this is what we feel great about on this Friday night when we come together to meditate to consider the Dhamma the Buddha's teaching what kinds of happiness do we have in the Buddha's teaching Well, the first happiness we have is, is this, this gathering, our ability to be here. We have the Buddha Center, we have here a meditation center. We have the happiness of our community, of our place, of our physical experience that allows us to get away from the stresses and the meaninglessness of banal existence and come to a spiritual place come to a gathering of spiritual intent where we all have the same goal and the same direction in our minds where there's wholesomeness where there's goodness where there's reassurance on our path So even before we start to practice, even before we do anything wholesome, we've got this greatness of community, the greatness of our ability to gather together in this way, just to be in this place. 
not physically the space, but to be in a, an environment that is encouraging of a spiritual pra practice. But there's more with the, the all of the practice that we do. The second great happiness that we have is from our morality, from our ethics. We have this reassurance in our minds that we are good people. It's a question, no? Am I a good person? Is there anything good about me, anything great, anything that wise people will esteem and appreciate and praise? Well, now there is. Here and now we're in a we're in a situation, we're in a position, we're on a path that leads towards greatness. That is made up of greatness, as great things all along the way. Starting with our ethics. We should be very happy and, and we are in these situations quite content in our spiritual state of wholesomeness of mind that we're not inclined towards greed or anger or delusion that we're actually struggling to keep our minds free from defilement You can be happy that at this moment we are good people. His goodness, of course, is momentary. People as well are changing from moment to moment. Yopu be pamajitva pachaso na pamajati. Whoever was negligent in the past, but later on is becomes vigilant, becomes mindful. So Manglo Kang Pabhasi Abhomuto Vachandima. Such a person lights up the world like the moon coming out from behind the cloud. I don't have to worry about what we were in the past. We've come here with all sorts of baggage. Well, leave the baggage at the door. Now we are on the right path. For this time we are cultivating wholesomeness. And we can feel great about that. And feel good about ourselves. The third happiness we have is when we start to become mindful, focused in the present moment. We tap into reality again. We sink our roots into the earth, into the soil of understanding, into the soil of mindfulness. And we, be, we are nourished by the reality of it. We leave behind our concepts and our beliefs and views and opinions, personalities even. We leave it all behind for here and now. Being aware of the body, the feelings, the mind, the emotions and the senses and so on. And this is happiness for us. This is great satisfaction. There's great satisfaction in being present. No matter how much pain or stress there might be in, in the present moment, once you're truly present, it all loses its edge. It all fades into just being experienced without any of the positive or negative qualities it just is its experience and we become quite peaceful this is the third happiness that we get from being from staying in on a Friday night the fourth we get is insight wisdom this is the fourth happiness that comes from being here today. So we start to think more about good teachings and listening to the teacher. We get some good information and tips and direction. 
we're able to direct our minds in the right direction and start to understand ourselves. We start to see the mind as impermanent, unsatisfying, uncontrollable. We see the body as well as unstable, and unpredictable, and we start to see that everything that we cling to is not worth clinging to. And we start to let go. And gain true wisdom and insight into reality. And finally, the last thing we get is freedom. The greatest happiness of all is freedom. We come here to practice and as we gain insight, even just sitting here listening to the Dhamma, it's quite, quite reasonable to expect freedom that we start to free ourselves from first from our wrong views and then from our wrong thoughts and then from our wrong emotions all the wrong, wrong, wrong the things that cause us suffering and stress or that cause us to hurt others all that is wrong about us fades away and what is right comes up we enter on the right path we enter into right thought we cultivate right view and we become free, free from all the entanglement, all the bonds of suffering that come from defilement. And so there's much happiness to be had, the greatest happiness. Two very different kinds of happiness. The one is very easy low-hanging fruit, easy for humans anyway, yeah, easy for I guess most beings to just, the Buddha likened this to a leper, a leper whose fingers or limbs are falling off or they're getting scabs and they take these, uh, the, the ends of their limbs and they, they cauterize them with, with flame, and apparently that brings some relief the Buddha said that's the sort of happiness, the sort of sensual happiness, trying to find relief like the leper. It's the desperate, it's the desperate sort of happiness, craving and clinging. One of my meditators pointed out something quite funny once, and it, it summed it up quite nicely. He said he was, he was, uh, he was sweeping in his kuti one day and there were two cockroaches and so, you know, not wanting to hurt them, he started sweeping them out and they started running around as cockroaches do and and he got them sort of together and near the door and as soon as they got really, really close together, they one of them jumped on the other and they started mating. <laughs> and he said that that about sums up the... Uh, the nature of craving is life is short. Let's seek gratification while we can. I mean, just the animal instinct, but it's in us all. We're, we're suffering so much that we grasp at anything. We're grasping at straws or grasping at nothing. Grasping at anything. But the other happiness is more complicated, more not complicated, but more subtle. It takes, it's more delicate. It takes a more delicate approach, a more refined approach. It can't just be grasped at, it has to be cultivated carefully. It has everything to do with care, patience, sophistication, I suppose, a delicacy, refinement. And so it's subtle and, and profound, it's lasting and it's stable and it's leading only to greater and greater happiness. This is the other thing is the easy happiness leads to less and less happiness. That's how the brain works. It's all caught up in the brain and chemicals. 
That's how samsara works, you might say. The more you get what you want, the more you want it, and the less satisfied you are with what you get. It's the law. It's sort of the law of diminishing returns of karma, or of of kama, of, of sensuality. Whereas the happiness of the Dhamma, it may be very little happiness at first because there's so much confusion in the mind, so much defilement that sitting still is not very pleasant. But the happiness increases over time. The more you practice, the more happiness, the more peace, the more freedom that comes. Two very different types of happiness. So congratulations and appreciation to everyone for choosing this way, which we consider to be far, far superior. And thank you for coming out tonight. There's the Dhamma. That's the Dhamma for this evening. Wishing you all good practice. Some questions here. If there are no thoughts between breaths in sitting meditation, I have no started noting the calm and empty states with just noting calm, calm and empty, empty. After some time in meditation doing this, the thoughts seem to come only as shapes and colors. Later it seems that the thoughts disappear completely. Should I especially notice these states or just go on with calm, calm and empty, empty? Well, in between sitting, I mean, you might do rising, falling, and then note sitting. We start to make it more complex through the, as you go through the course, we'll add sitting, so rising, falling, sitting. But, uh, you know, it sounds like you're, what you're doing is fine, except when you start to see things, you should say seeing, seeing. When you feel completely calm or, or, or quiet, you should note quiet, quiet, when there's... When the thoughts disappear, you can actually just say disappearing or knowing, knowing that they're disappearing. If you like it, you would say liking, liking, but it sounds like you're doing fine. I wouldn't worry too much about what you're doing. It may be good if you came and did a meditation course, it might sort of make things clearer. Hmm. Someone's re-asking a question. I must have been mean and not answered it the first time. Uh, I did the basic meditation course and now there are two courses. Huh, I wonder with who? With me? Someone using a pseudonym. I have a teacher I do reports to. Okay, so it's not me. I would say 90% of the days in the year I don't meditate. 90% of the days in the year, that's not very good. I 90% of the years... 90% of the days in the year I don't meditate. That's a lot. I tried long all-day meditations. I tried doing very short meditations every five minutes, and I never persevere more than a few days. I'm really frustrated with this. Can't find a solution. Hmm. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, maybe you should start meditating on your daily life, the sorts of things that you're doing that may be not conducive for meditation practice. I mean, my answers are not going to give you the solution. There's nothing I can say that's going to make it right for you. You just need someone to give you a kick in the pants or to do it yourself and actually begin to meditate. Figure out what it is that you're doing that keeps you from meditating. Maybe there's a version to meditation. Maybe you need to come and do a course with me. Maybe I'll be a better teacher. Maybe your teachers are just really lousy. <laughs> I don't know. I'm just teasing. But uh, there's nothing to do but just do it. Nike, isn't that a Nike saying? Doesn't Nike get it right? Can sensory deprivation tanks be used for meditation? I mean, I've always found this sort of fascinating, that idea, because for us it's all about the senses. You know, it's not really about shutting off the senses. I mean, that's where all the problems come from. 
why would you want to deprive the senses when that's where all your studying has to be done? I don't know. I mean, that's a sort of should be filed under the speculative sort of questions. Nothing to do with our our technique. I certainly never tell people to do. So. Certainly never tell people to enter into sensory deprivation. Since Buddhists do not believe in determinism, is it correct to say that the future cannot be predicted with 100% accuracy except for certain events? See, determinism and... You're asking still on the level of determinism or free will. We don't work on that level. That's not how Buddhism thinks, for lack of a better word, where Buddhism acts. Buddhism is very much about here and now. It's about learning the true nature of reality. It's not about philosophizing about whether the future can or can't be predicted. That's not what Buddhism is about. So I'm going to cop out and say that's not what we deal with. How do we sign up to take a course with you? You can go to our website at sirimangalo.org Looks like someone's Robin has posted a link. How long did it take you to learn and be fluent in Thai? Now that's not a question for me. But whatever, I'll indulge it because you're here in person. I wouldn't indulge these sorts of questions. Because there's just too many of them, right? Questions that are not unrelated to meditation. It took me about a year to get fairly fluent in Thai. Um, but, you know, I was learning for six or seven years and um, it really got, it improved in stages. It got really good when I, when I first when I learned to read, then I started taking the Thai Dhamma classes and I had to take the exams in Thai. So I had to write an essay, a two-page essay in Thai, which is a lot more difficult than it might sound. Spelling is very difficult. Uh, and then I started teaching people. I was actually... Um, Asked to teach meditation to Thai people And then I had to really learn how to Get my concepts across And then I actually started giving talks in Thai And that really got So yeah, it went in stages Became quite fluent I guess I'm still probably fairly fluent Seeing some lay people use the word Sangha Isn't the word reserved for monks, nuns and novices? Well, there's two kinds of Sangha There's The Sangha um, the Sangha that you're thinking of is the Vinaya Sangha Which requires actually four monks and up One monk is not a Sangha I once gave a talk and I was talking about the difference And I said, any monk is Sangha But that's only a Samuti Sangha And this lay man here really What a jerk He came up to me later and he said Yeah, I just wanted to talk to you You're, You were wrong This guy, Thai guy He was a real sort of He was very much full of himself and so he came up to me and he had to correct me because I was wrong And he was right, I was wrong That one monk is not a sangha It takes at least four monks to be a sangha But he's wrong in the sense that the sangha is the entire monastic community And we all belong to the sangha One monk is a part of the sangha, is what I was trying to say uh, Is sangha, in Thai they would even say a monk is sangha It's like a, a soldier is military doesn't mean that soldier is the military it means they are military uh, but that's one kind the other kind, the Sutta Sangha is uh, all those people who are on the path to enlightenment so anyone who's already practicing the Buddha's teaching could be considered Sangha because they're on the path to Sotapanna they are doing the Pubanga Manga And so it's just a matter of how uh, you know, What level you mean the word Sangha Because then there's also Arya Sangha Arya Sangha is uh, and Of course enlightened being So Arya Sangha you have to actually Have reached Manga Jnana That's the Savaka Sangha That's talked about in the Sangha Nusati but a Sangha is just a community, the word just means community So it could also be used in non-Buddhist sense, I suppose I don't know that it ever is used like that in the Pali I can't remember really Ok, 
okay well thank you everyone have a good night